history on this channel, and for a transgender history channel, that probably shouldn't be surprising. We've also done some mythological analysis, which we've turned around and looked at through the lens of euhemerism. But what we haven't really done yet is literary analysis. It was bound to happen sooner or later, since the Greeks and Romans didn't just leave us historical writings, they left a lot of stuff that we might consider today to be fiction as well. It's also the first time we'll be dealing with a more transmasculine topic, which I've gotten a lot of requests for over the years, but haven't gotten to until now, and I feel a little bad about that. Because look, this channel is called We Have Always Existed, because it's about transgender history in the ancient Mediterranean. So far, we've talked about transfeminine priestesses, an ambiguously transgender Roman emperor, some intersex and generally gender non-conforming topics, and a whole lot of eunuching. Something's missing there, to a certain extent that reveals my own bias. I'm a trans woman, so naturally transfeminine topics interest me more. But transfeminine topics also tend to be more well known. The catalyst that got me started on this channel was seeing people talk about the transfeminine Scythian priestesses, but not really having any good sources to find out more information on them. Nobody was talking about it in a way that provided any actual evidence other than stuffy academic papers, and, well, somebody had to communicate this stuff, and I figured, I'm a somebody, why don't I do it? But trans men are frequently left out of the conversation when it comes to trans topics, and that really sucks. I've read various different reasons why that might be the case. On average, trans men tend to pass a little better the further they get into transition. They tend to be a little more low-key than their chaotic trans sisters, and they tend to attract less ire from TERFs who view them as confused wayward lesbians rather than sick perverted men in dresses. And on one hand, I feel like that last point might be a little nice. I think all of my trans sisters could use a break from being the focal point of an entire international group of hateful maniacs. But I've also listened to trans men before, and I know that the alienation they feel from the community, as well as the condescension and infantilization that they get from TERFs is clearly not a great time either. Trans men and trans women envying each other's positions. Name a more iconic duo. Who's got it harder? Who's got it easier? Who cares? Pointless conversation. What are we both doing to lift each other up? That's a much more interesting conversation, I think. But look, it might not have felt that way so far, and I do apologize for that. This channel is for you too, my trans brothers. Trans people deserve to know and own our own histories, and that's not just exclusive to people who look like me. Transmasculine history has some layers of complexity on top of it that set it apart from transfeminine history. For example, there's a significant overlap between transmasculine and lesbian culture that doesn't really exist for trans women and cis men. As a result, it's sometimes difficult to discuss one without the other. Today we're going to be talking about the Greek poet Lucian and his Dialogues of the Courtesans. We'll talk about the poet himself, the particular dialogue that relates to the subject of this channel, some context to help it make more sense, and finally, some literary analysis. As usual, your support on Patreon is greatly appreciated. It really does make a difference in helping me turn this into something that's a little more self-sustaining instead of an expensive hobby. You'll get all sorts of perks, including access to our private Discord channel, access to videos before they come out, your name in the credits, my eternal gratitude, and more. Link in the description. It starts at just a buck a month. But if Patreon support isn't in the cards for you, that's okay. You can still help this channel by liking, commenting, and subscribing. When you do that, it tells the algorithm that people like you like content like this, so they're more likely to show this content to people like you. Trans people deserve to know and own our own histories. If you believe that, as I do, then a simple like, comment, and subscribe goes a long way in helping spread these ideas. Let's do what we can to counter the big lie told by the forces of hatred, the one that trans people are just this new modern invention. We're not. Human history without trans people has never existed, and so long as humanity continues to endure, it never will. Without further ado. Chapter 1 Lucian's Dialogues of the Courtesans and New Comedy. We talked about Lucian briefly in our video on the Galli, 
he wrote a piece called On the Syrian Goddess, where he talks about a potential explanation for why the Galli worshipped Kibali in the particular way that they did. Most of what we know about Lucian comes from his writings, which is a bit of a problem when it comes to trying to piece together some sort of biography about the guy. After all, he was a satirist. But here's the best we can tell. He was born around 125 CE in the city of Samosata in the province of Syria, which includes modern-day Syria as well as parts of Turkey and Lebanon. Today, Samosata is called Samsat, and it's in the southeast corner of Turkey along the Euphrates River, about 100 kilometers from the Syrian border. Lucian's family seemed to be lower middle class, and as a young man he apprenticed under his uncle, who was a sculptor, but he didn't seem to like it terribly well. So, he ran away to Ionia on the west coast of Asia Minor, near Mount Ida, to pursue an education. Eventually, he settled in Athens, which is where he wrote most of his work. Even though he lived during Roman rule of Greece, and he came from an area where Aramaic was most commonly spoken, he wrote in Greek. Now, when it comes to ancient writers whose work survives, Lucian is one of the most fortunate. Nearly a hundred titles attributed to him survive today. At least a few of those were probably not his, but still, that's a lot when you compare it with other ancient writers. The Roman writer Livy, for example, wrote 142 books on Roman history, and we have 35 of them. The Athenian tragic poet Aeschylus wrote 90 plays, and we have six. 79 of the Athenian orator Hyperides' speeches were written written down, and today we've got two of them. The Athenian poet Philemon wrote 97 works, and we've got fragments of a couple of them. A whole lot of this stuff just gets lost over the centuries, and so it's kind of a minor miracle that Lucian's work survives as well as it does, especially since he made some disparaging words toward Christians. And when Christianity became the dominant religion in the empire, they really, 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 really liked purging anti-Christian works. Even still, his works became popular in the Byzantine Empire, where it became part of the school curriculum. So yeah, we're pretty lucky to have what we have. One of the most interesting titles to me is called A True Story. It's about a group of travelers who go beyond the Pillars of Hercules and end up on the moon somehow, where they get involved in a war between the King of the Moon and the King of the Sun over who gets to colonize the planet Venus. There's a lot more to it from there, but if that sounds awesome to you, then you're not alone. That sounds awesome to me, too. And it's arguably the first example of a story that we could call science fiction. And it's nearly 2,000 years old. I'm planning to do a reading of that story on this channel because I think it's just so awesome. It's not transgender history, but it's still a lot of fun. But today, we're not talking about a true story. We're talking about the dialogues of the courtesans. It's a collection of short pieces, kind of like skits or sketches, usually between a group of prostitutes. They share gossip with one another and complain quite a bit about their clients falling in love with them or falling in love with other girls, other girls stealing their clients from them, about the anxiety of receiving their first client, about clients who get too rough, about dealing with men who are desperate for their attention. The list goes on. At times it's dark, but for the most part it's a lot of fun. Dialogues of the Courtesans is a great example of what the ancients called new comedy. Now, without getting too far into the weeds here, Greek comedy was split into three distinct eras. Old comedy was popular in the 5th century CE, it had a lot of political satire, to the point where some old comedy plays actually had political figures as characters in the play. If you're familiar with the comic playwright Aristophanes, some of his works are great examples of old comedy. Next comes middle comedy. They were much more focused on mythological scenes, or so we're told. None of it survives today except in small fragments, so I can't really comment on it much. Finally, we have new comedy. It was popular during Macedonian hegemony in Greece, the late 4th century to the early 2nd century CE. It was much more focused on situations of everyday life. They would take stereotypical stock characters and shove them into different situations. If you want to think of these as ancient sitcoms or comedy sketches, you wouldn't be too far off the mark here. Now, Dialogues of the Courtesans is absolutely new comedy. 
but that doesn't mean he was a new comedy playwright. These three eras of comedy existed centuries before Lucien was even born, so he exists outside of these movements. He did write in different styles. The one we're looking at today just happens to be a new comedy style. It's like one of those retro rock bands that was big in the early 2010s playing basically Led Zeppelin worship. Yeah, they're playing in a 70s rock style, but that doesn't mean they're a 70s rock band. By then the genre had been codified. It already existed in its tropes. Doesn't mean that innovation is not still possible, but it is not really the same thing as the originators of the style. For our purposes today, we're going to be looking at Dialogue 5. It's not terribly long, so I'm just going to read the whole thing here. I'm pretty sure the version I have is in the public domain, but I guess we'll find out if we get a copyright strike, won't we? I'll put the text on screen as we go, which will make it a little easier for you to follow along. But before we get into the text itself, I want to spend some time talking about the world of prostitution in ancient Athens. After all, this is dialogues of the courtesans, and if we don't have a full understanding of how prostitution worked in the ancient world, we're going to fill in the blanks with a whole bunch of modern day assumptions, and that's not very helpful. So let's start by taking a look at the world of Athenian prostitution. From there, we'll read Dialogue 5 in its entirety and take some time to understand what it all means. Chapter 2. Understanding the World of Athenian Prostitution When you think of prostitution, a pretty specific image tends to come up. Unless you happen to live in one of the places of the world where prostitution is legal, which is more places than you might think, you might imagine ladies of the night selling their trade on dimly lit street corners, dealing with abuse from exploitative pimps from within butterfly collars, and staying just outside of the reach of Johnny Law. But that's not what it was like in ancient Greece. At least, not exactly. The Athenian lawmaker Solon, who supposedly laid the foundations for what would become Athenian democracy, supposedly founded a number of brothels within the city, paid for by public funds. These brothels were mandated to provide sex for the reasonable price of one obol. So when incels today talk about using government to provide access to sex, this is not even a new idea. Six obols was worth a drachma, which was the standard of currency in ancient Greece. Based on what the Athenian general turned historian Xenophon tells us, half a drachma per day would have been enough to provide a somewhat comfortable living for the lower classes in Athenian society. Now there's a lot of talk about living wages, the amount one needs to earn to afford a relatively comfortable quality of life in the modern world. In Toronto, which is a comparative size to ancient Athens, relatively speaking, not the same population of course, but relative to the average size of cities at the time, that's $25.05 per hour as of late 2023, according to the Living Wage Network. That assumes full-time employment. Now let's just round that down to 25 bucks an hour just to make it make the math simpler. So a living wage in Toronto is around 200 bucks per day. If we assume that's the equivalent to half a drachma, that means one drachma would be about 400 bucks. Divide that by six and you get 67 Canadian dollars for one obol. In other words, if we had the same system today that they had in ancient Athens, you could hire a government hooker for about the cost of a new video game. My how times have changed. Why did Solon do this? Well, it's debatable whether or not we did, but we're, we're not going to get into that. If he did do it, why did he do it? When we talk about the ancient polis or city-state, we're talking about the city itself as well as the area around it. The polis of ancient Athens, for example, included the city of Athens, obviously, as well as about 3,000 square kilometers around it. That included the farmland and several other towns as well. Athens itself is not a coastal city, of course, but it did control the busy port town of Piraeus. Various ships would arrive at Piraeus, People would disembark, cargo would be unloaded, and sailors would have to find some way to spend their time while waiting for the ship to take off again. Many of these were young single men with a little bit of money to spend, so do the math. So by legalizing, taxing, and regulating prostitution, Solon brought a lot of money into Athens. But there was another goal. By providing more accessible prostitution, the Athenian government would be able to reduce the number of 
chaste young Athenian girls who were deflowered by these horn dog sailors. The prostitutes were also trained in how to provide sexual pleasure, which Athenian women by and large were not very good at if we believe the exclusively male writers who wrote about such things. A woman's role was to be a housewife and a mother, and sex was something you did to somebody, not with somebody. You either took an active or a passive role in sex, and the active role was almost exclusively limited to Athenian citizen men. Athenian wives tended to be very passive during sex, which didn't seem to be particularly enjoyable for them or for their husbands. But being the wildly misogynistic culture they were, Athenians only cared about the sexual satisfaction of their citizens, and only men could be citizens. Were all prostitutes the same? No, in fact, there were several different categories. First of all, the slave prostitutes and streetwalkers. These were called pornai, which was a corruption of the word pernemi, or to sell, and it's obvious where we get a modern word from as well. These girls were owned by a pornoboskos, who acted kind of like a pimp. They worked in the public brothels that Solon established, but there were some privately owned ones as well. A pornoboskos was looked at as sort of like a used car salesman is today, a perfectly legitimate but not particularly reputable way to make a living. No offense to you if you're a used car salesperson in the audience. I'm sure you yourself are a perfectly trustworthy and reputable individual. He would train his newly acquired porni in how to please men, which they would do in the brothels. What about the brothels themselves? Well, they didn't seem like great places to be. One particular archaeological site in Athens is called the Karamikos district, which is called that because there were a lot of ceramics workers in that area. A series of buildings in the area, Z1, Z2, and Z3, have been identified as brothels. Z1 was destroyed in an earthquake after the late 5th century BCE. Z2 was built shortly after that and was destroyed when the Spartans conquered Athens at the end of the Peloponnesian War in 404 BCE. And Z3 from there was rebuilt and survived until the end of the 4th century BCE when another earthquake took it down. Z3 is the one that survives best today. It was about 500 square meters in size, and I know that sounds enormous. That's like 5,300 square feet. That's a really, really big building, but I double checked in a couple of different sources. It really actually was that big. It was a single story and divided into a whole bunch of smaller rooms. In some of these rooms, we found loom weights, and some archaeologists have interpreted that to assume that this was a textile factory, conveniently ignoring the amulets and statues of Aphrodite and Eros that we found, as well as the like hundreds of drinking vessels. They also ignore the fact that no ancient source mentions that this was a textile factory, despite the fact that the area was pretty well documented. Using a loom was considered feminine work and a housewife's job, but it wasn't necessarily only a housewife's job. In fact, women who were slaves often did this sort of work as well. So the fact that this was filled with both erotic art and weaving tools suggests that this was a brothel and that in between seeing clients, the prostitutes would weave. It was also one of the nicer spots in town as far as brothels go. There was a garden courtyard, there were baths, there was a dining room, and there were some beautiful mosaics on the floor as well. But the fact that these porni would spend a pretty big chunk of their day having sex with random men for a legally imposed pittance and on top of that, the Pornoboscos would take part of their wages as well, or weaving in a dark room, suggests that they probably didn't have the best lives, even if this was one of the nicer brothels in Athens. Porni weren't necessarily slaves, though it seems like they often were. Okay, so that's the Porni, but we do have another category, the Hetairai. And these were significantly different. In fact, Hetairai were often considered very cultured and very educated. Rather than just providing sexual services, they also served as entertainers. A tradition for upper-class Athenian men was something called a symposium. This was a sort of social gathering where men would recline on couches, eat, drink wine out of a bowl called a kylix, and entertain each other. If you're familiar with Plato, you might recognize the name Symposium. One of his works is named after these parties because it takes place at one of these parties. It was for men only, like much of Athenian life. 
women had to stay home, take care of the kids, take care of the house, and maybe take care of themselves with an Elizbos, which was a dildo made out of dog skin. Yes, you heard that correctly. Yes, I read that correctly, my god. But after a while, if you're hosting parties, it tends to get tiring if it's just a bunch of dudes all the time. So if you were a particularly cool guy, and you wanted all your friends to know that you were a particularly cool guy, then little boy then you might hire some hitairai to come to your symposium these girls would dance sing play instruments serve them food and have conversations with them and when it came down to it they often had sex as well but it wasn't as transactional as it was with the porn eye in fact they could enter long-term relationships with athenian men becoming their palake or concubine, sometimes receiving lavish gifts in exchange. These women were allowed to develop their intellectual side far more than most Athenian women, which is why they were allowed to join in at the symposia. They often lived on their own or with other hetairai, and even though they were sometimes slaves, sometimes not, they seemed to have more autonomy and freedom than the average Athenian freeborn woman would. It's suspected that some Hetairai were upper-class women from other cities that the Athenians had conquered. Smart, sexy, witty, talented, great in bed, more freedom than the average Athenian woman. It's no wonder these girls were highly sought after. But I love the like patriarchal logic here, because in the process of putting their women in place, so to speak, they became undesirable. Athenian men went out of their way to make sure that the women in their society were nothing like the Hetairai whom they found intriguing and desirable. They made life worse for women, but they also made life worse for themselves. Patriarchy makes everything bad for everybody. Were there male prostitutes as well? Yes, there were, but in keeping with the Athenian patriarchal ideas, they were described with verbs and female prostitutes, porna and hetaira, those are the singulars, those are nouns. So if you were a male prostitute, it was something you did. And if you were a female prostitute, it was something that you were. Men did prostitution, but they could stop doing it but if you were a porna or a hetaira, that's your identity. So what about the girls in Dialogues of the Courtesans? Were they pornai or hetairai? It doesn't ever say clearly. However, several of the girls talk about going to parties and that doesn't seem like something pornai were allowed to do. As well, in Dialogue 6, between Corina and her mother Crobile, they talk about how difficult it's been since Corina's father had passed away. They sold all his blacksmithing tools to make ends meet, but now they're out of stuff to sell and they don't have much to eat. But Crobile talks about a way that Karina can support both herself and her mother. This exchange reads, quote, I worked out that when you were as old as you are now, it would be easy for you both to keep me and provide yourself with clothes, that you would be rich and have purple dresses and maids. How so? What do you mean by that, mother? by associating with young men, drinking, and sleeping with them for money. Like Daphnis's daughter Lyra? Yes, but she's a Hetaira. It's worth noting that Lucian specifically uses the word Hetaira here. Now that said, the boundary between Pornai and Hetairai wasn't always as cut and dry as you might think, and some scholars wonder whether or not there was actually a difference between the two categories, but that is beyond the scope of this video. That said, I do think these girls were meant to be Hetairai, but at the same time, remember that this is set during Golden Age Athens, and it was written several hundred years later. So Lucian is bound to have gotten some of the details wrong. In fact, it's important to remember too, these are fictional representations of courtesans, not courtesans themselves. So now that we know a little bit more about what Athenian prostitution might have looked like, let's take a look at the dialogue. Apologies in advance, there is a lot of misgendering in the next section. I chose to preserve it because it will make more sense based on the analysis that we're about to do, but mm, viewer discretion is advised. Outside of the dialogue, though, when it comes to the actual analysis, we'll be identifying characters the way they identify themselves. Chapter 3. Dialogue 5. We've been hearing strange things about you, Leina, 
They say that Megillah, the rich lesbian woman, is in love with you just like a man, that you live with each other and do goodness knows what together. Hello, blushing? Tell me if it's true. Quite true, Clenarion, but I'm ashamed for it's unnatural. In the name of Mother Aphrodite, what's it all about? What does the woman want? What do you do when you're together? You see, you don't love me or you wouldn't hide such things from me. I love you as much as I love any woman, but she's terribly like a man. I don't understand what you mean, unless she's a sort of woman for the ladies. They say there are women like that in Lesbos, with faces like men, and unwilling to consort with men but only with women, as though they themselves were men. It's something like that. Well, tell me all about it. Tell me how she made her first advances to you, how you were persuaded, and what followed. She herself and another rich woman with the same accomplishments, Demonasa from Corinth, were organizing a drinking party and had taken me along to provide them with music. But when I'd had finished playing and it was late and time to turn in and they were drunk, Megillah said, Come along, Leina. It's high time we were in bed. You sleep here between us. And did you? What happened after that? At first they kissed me, like men, not simply bringing their lips to mine, but opening their mouths a little, embracing me and squeezing my breasts. Demonasa even bit me as she kissed me, and I didn't know what to make of it. Eventually Megilla, being now rather heated, pulled off her wig, which was very realistic and fitted very closely, and revealed the skin of her head, which was shaved close just as on the most energetic of athletes. The sight gave me a shock, but she said, Leina, have you ever seen such a good-looking young fellow? I don't see one here, Megilla, said I. Don't make a woman out of me, said she. My name is Megillus, and I've been married to Demonasa for ever so long. She's my wife. I laughed at that, Clenarion, and said, Then, unknown to us, Megillus, you were a man all the time, just as they say Achilles once hid among the girls, and you have everything that a man has, and can play the part of a man to Demonasa? I haven't got what you mean, said she. I don't need it at all. You'll find I've a much pleasanter method of my own. You're surely not like Hermaphroditus, said I, equipped both as a man and a woman, as many people are said to be. For I still didn't know, Clenarion, what it was all about. But she said, No, Leina, I'm all man. Well, I said, I've heard the Boeotian flute girl is Minadora, repeating tales she'd heard at home, and telling us how someone at Thebes had turned from woman to man, someone who was also an excellent soothsayer, and was, I think, called Tiresias. That didn't happen to you, did it? No, Leina, she said, I was born a woman, like the rest of you, but I have the mind, and the desires, and everything else of a man. And don't you find these desires enough, said I? If you don't believe me, Leina, said she, just give me a chance, and you'll find I'm as good as any man. I have a substitute of my own. Only give me a chance, and you'll see. Well, I did, my dear, because she begged so hard and presented me with a costly necklace and a very fine linen dress. Then I threw my arms around her as though she were a man, and she went to work kissing me and panting and apparently enjoying herself immensely. What did she do? How? That's what I'm most interested to hear. Don't inquire too closely into the details. They're not very nice, so by Aphrodite in heaven, I won't tell you. Chapter 4. Jeez, where do we even start with this one? Oh boy, is there a lot to pick through with that one? Is your brain just like bristling with possibilities right now? Mine is too. We're going to dig a lot deeper here. To start, a reminder, this is not a historical text. I mean, it, it is a historical text because like it's really old, right? So it is a historical text, but it's not history. This is fiction. So what we're doing today is just as much literary analysis as it is historical analysis. Now, the fact that Leina and Clenarion both refer to Megillus and Demonasa as lesbians doesn't mean what you think. Not, not quite. 
Anyway, Lesbos is an island in the Achaean Sea, just off the coast of Ionia, where Lucian grew up, and just south of Mount Ida, if you remember that from the Hermaphroditus video. People who live on the island are called lesbians, regardless of their sexuality, and so are the island's exports. The island has a long history of winemaking, and lesbian wine was very highly sought after in the ancient world. It still is today as well, but for some reason they call it Lesbos wine now. I don't understand why. If I saw a bottle of lesbian wine in the liquor store, I would definitely buy a bottle. Even the island itself went through a bit of a rebranding and is sometimes just called Mytilene today after the island's largest city in one of the biggest collective no homos I've ever seen. But okay, lesbian in this context means somebody from Lesbos. But the fact that Lucian made Demonassa and Megillus from Lesbos is not a coincidence. That's because Lesbos is where the poet Sappho was from. And if you're queer yourself, you probably know where this is going. But if not, that's okay. I imagine I probably have at least a few heteros in the audience. You're welcome to be here just as much as anybody else. Bring any sexuality or gender you want. All you need is a curious and open mind. Sappho was a poet who lived somewhere around the 7th or 6th centuries BCE. So after Homer, but before Aristophanes and Plato and all the other Athenian Golden Age writers that we talked about earlier. She wrote a lot of poetry, and some of it was about how much she loved women, and I mean, mood, to be honest. That's why we call erotic feelings between women sapphic, and women who are into women lesbians. The more you know. This was well known in Lucian's time as well. So the fact that Megillus comes from Lesbos is not a coincidence. We were to view Megillus as a lesbian in both senses of the word. And that's why after he repeatedly insists he's a man, Leina and Clonarion continue to refer to him as a woman. Now I understand that he, him, lesbians are a thing. I just, I, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that, but I also want to make it clear that, at least from an ancient perspective, this is not what's happening here, okay? But as the dialogue goes on, we start to see more and more how confused Leina and Clonarion are by the whole thing. First, Leina says Megillus was terribly like a man, but then Clonarion's only frame of reference is to ask if he's a hetairistra, which, as we mentioned in the video on gender transgression in early Christianity, is a word that was used to describe women who were into women. But Megillus makes it clear that he's a man. He talks about it in several different ways too, like he's not subtle about this here. But even after he says, don't make a woman out of me, my name is Megillus, Megillus being a very clear masculine name, still Leina and Clonarion don't seem to clue into it. Leina asks three particularly interesting mythological questions here, and I want to take a closer look at each one of them because they say a lot. These questions can help us understand how the ancients viewed gender transgression in general, so let's take a look. Question one, is he like Achilles? Then, unknown to us, Megillus, you were a man all this time, just as they say Achilles once hid among the girls, and you have everything that a man has, and can play the part of a man to Demonassa. That's Leina's first question. What's she referring to here? We all know Achilles. We all know he's the guy who was at the Trojan War, who was really, really strong, who killed a bunch of guys until he took an arrow to the heel and then died. Spoiler alert. We often think of the Iliad as the story of the Trojan War, but the book actually starts nine years into the Trojan War, and at the end of it, the war is still going and Achilles is still alive. So it's not the whole thing, not even close. It's hard to figure out exactly how long the Iliad was supposed to be and like time-wise, but most scholars agree it was a couple of months at best. We're told about Achilles' death in other sources, and of course there are plenty of mythological stories about Achilles that start before the Iliad as well. Leina is referring in particular to Achilles' time on Skyros. This is a Greek island northeast of Athens. The most detailed version of this myth that we have comes from the Achilliad, which is an unfinished epic poem by the Roman writer Statius. He wrote during the second half of the first century CE, during the reign of the Emperor Domitian. The story is absolutely much older than that though. It seems like Stadius didn't get very far in writing this one, 
what we've got is the first book and a small part of the second book, and that's it. That's a real shame, because this could have been a really great source for the myths of Achilles. Alas. Anyway, as the myth goes, Achilles was prophesied to die in the Trojan War, and his mother Thetis did not want this to happen. So she disguised Achilles as a girl and took him to Skiros, where she told the king of Skiros that this was her daughter, and she was raised among Amazons, and was quite brutish, and so needed to act like a girl by spending some time around civilized women. So Achilles lived on Skiros for a time, and it seemed that all was well. But here's the thing. There was another prophecy that said the Greeks couldn't win the Trojan War without Achilles on their side. So Odysseus was sent to find him. He tracked Achilles down to Skiros, made it seem like the island was under attack, and Achilles sprang to action, grabbed some weapons, defended his friends, and outed himself as Achilles. They took him off to the Trojan War, and you know the rest. If you're thinking that sounds pretty gender, yeah, you're not alone. There's a lot of fun you can have with this story. In fact, that's exactly what Maya Dean did with her novel, Wrath Goddess Sing. This is in the... I, I hope this is in the frame. This is a reimagining of Achilles not as a man in disguise, but as a transgender woman who went to Skiros because that was a place where girls like her were safe where they had all sorts of different herbs and potions to stave off testosterone, and where she could live in peace. How does this change the tale of Achilles? What about the gods ever present and interfering in the life of Achilles during the Iliad? How do they fit into all this? And what about Odysseus, Agamemnon, Hector, Paris, all the other Greek and Trojan heroes? How does this story play out? It's worth a read. This isn't a sponsored ad or anything, though, Maya, th this, Maya sent me this copy. Does that count as sponsored? I don't think it does. Anyway, I don't think it is a sponsored ad. I just think you would like this book if you like this channel. Link in the description if you want to get your hands on a copy. It's worth checking out. Anyway, back to Megillus. Was that the case with him? Was he like Achilles? No, he wasn't. I haven't got what you mean. I don't need it at all. You'll find I have a much pleasanter method of my own. The allusion to Achilles represents gender in terms of material circumstance. Achilles was a man, un unless you ask Maya Dean, of course, who had to pretend to be a woman in order to protect himself. He was faced with a choice. He could either go off to war and die, or he could pretend to be a woman. He didn't want to die, so the choice was obvious. But that's not Megillus. Question two, is he like Hermaphroditus? You're surely not like Hermaphroditus, then, equipped both as a man and a woman, as many people are said to be. Leanna's second question is, of course, talking about Hermaphroditus. And like most myths, the details around the story of Hermaphroditus vary widely. In some stories, Hermaphroditus is a boy fused with a nymph, becoming, as Ovid says, neither man nor woman, but neither and yet both. In others, Hermaphroditus is born as essentially an intersex deity. Lucian definitely knew about the Hermaphroditus myths since he mentions it in another dialogue as well. But he also seems to have written Leina as somebody who didn't really know how Hermaphroditus worked other than to say he was equipped as both a man and a woman. There's obviously a lot more to say about Hermaphroditus. We've already done an entire video on the subject. Check it out. So, is Megillah like Hermaphroditus? No, Leina. I'm all man. Hermaphroditus represents gender in terms of nature. Not nature as in like, like a fertility symbol, but more anatomically. But no, Megillus is not like that. He doesn't have intersex anatomy. Question three, is he like Tiresias? Well, I've heard the Boeotian flute girl Ismina Dora repeating tales she'd heard at home, and told how someone from Thebes turned from woman into man, and was also an excellent soothsayer, and was, I think, called Tiresias. That didn't happen to you, did it? I, I love how much she's reaching at this point. She's like, okay, well, you're not Achilles, so you're not pretending to be a woman, and you're not Hermaphroditus, so you're not equipped like a man and a woman. Well, 
I heard a friend who heard from a friend who said that some guy turned into a girl or something like that. Is that you? I, it's, it's hilarious. I knew at some point we were going to be talking about Tiresias on this channel because their story is just, just so gender. Tiresias is one of those mythological characters that shows up all over the place. They're in Sophocles' plays, Oedipus Rex and Antigone, in Euripides' Bacchae, in the Odyssey, in Hesiod's works, and of course in Ovid's Metamorphoses. Again, like most mythological stories, there's lots of different versions, they're full of contradictions, but there's one in particular we're going to pay attention to here. It's going to make sense why in just a moment. Tiresias was the son of a shepherd and the nymph Shariklo. At some point he was out for a walk when he came upon a couple of snakes doing it, and I guess he was a bit of a prude, so he grabbed a stick and whacked at the snakes. He didn't want to see them doing their thing. That turned him into a woman. She then went on to live her life, because what else are you going to do? She married a man and even had a child with him. Seven years later, she was out for a walk in the same area and found the same two snakes doing it. Depending on who you ask, she whacked them again, or left them alone, or just stomped on them, but whatever it is she did, that turned her back into a man. And that's how he lived the rest of his life. There's a lot more to say about Tiresias. We'll probably dig into their story again at the some other point on the channel. But the moral of the story is, if you really want to trans your gender, but you're just not feeling quite brave enough, and you don't want to travel all the way to Turkey to find the Salmasus spring, just go out into the forest, and when you see a couple snakes doing it, whack them with a stick. It worked for Tiresias. But did it work for Megillus? No, because that's not him either. At this point, Megillus gets impatient and responds by saying, I was born a woman like the rest of you, but I have the mind and the thoughts and the desires and everything else of a man. Chapter 5. And that's pretty clear, isn't it? Even if we understand that this isn't terribly affirming from a modern perspective, how could we read Megillus as anything other than a transgender man? But of course there are additional complications. When Megillus first meets Leina at a party, he's wearing a wig and dressed like a lady. And it's not just any wig either. Lucian goes out of his way to make sure we know it's a particularly convincing wig. He takes the wig off when the three of them are in bed together, and it's at that point that he reveals that he is, of course, Megillus, not Megilla. In other words, he's a lady in the streets and a man in the sheets. So what's going on here? As we mentioned, Lucian was a satirist. And as we also mentioned, the type of characters we see in new comedy are stock characters, the sort of representations of what you would see in everyday life in Athenian society. Leina and Clonarion both serve as stereotypes of gossipy women, for example. But what about Megillus? Was he a caricature? For us to answer that question, we'd have to figure out what he's a caricature of. So let's take a look. Is he a caricature of lesbians? That is the sexuality lesbian, not, not the island lesbian. It's tempting to think of it that way. After all, we do have in the modern world the stereotype of women who are into women being more masculine, even though that's far from universal. You'd think this was a, like, cishet stereotype, but it's not. The more masculine a woman tends to be, the more likely she's going to be read as gay in queer spaces, to the point where cis femme lesbians sometimes get read as straight girl tourists in queer spaces. But was that a stereotype in the ancient world as it is in the modern world? To answer that question, we need to get a better understanding of what the view toward lesbians was in the Greco-Roman world. After all, again, to understand satire, you need to understand what you're satirizing. You're not really going to understand what makes Galaxy Quest great if you've never seen Star Trek, you know? So let's look at the representations we have of lesbians in the ancient world and see what we can come up with in terms of some sort of stereotype. Unfortunately, there isn't much. Scholar K.J. Dover's book, Greek Homosexuality, is about 200 pages long, and the section on women who love women is barely a dozen pages. And this is not the fault of K.J. Dover. He is doing his best. There are just not very many sources on this sort of thing. So what do we have? Plato does mention women who love women in the symposium, which we talked about earlier. 
where he talks about his absolutely wild theory about the differences between the sexes, which we're not going to get into here in depth, even though it's a lot of fun to go through. But the TLDR is that originally we were all spheres. We had four arms, four legs, and two faces on a single head. We also had two sets of sex organs and, well, everything else. The spheres walked upright on four legs, and when they wanted to run, they rolled. They did, like, cartwheels. There were three types of these spheres, male, female, and androgynous, the three genders. The male ones were male on both sides, the female ones were female on both sides, and the androgynous ones had one of each on each side. The spheres angered the gods by trying to conquer them, and so in punishment, the gods decided to cut them in half. And that's how we get anatomically modern humans. That's why we love each other. We're seeking to be whole again, but we still have that memory of our original forms. So if there was a stereotype of lesbians being masculine, then you'd think it would be the ones who came from the androgynous spheres, right? Because they've got more masculineness in their history, so to speak. But in fact, the opposite is true. Plato says, quote, the women who are a section of the women do not care for men, but have female attachments. The female companions are of this sort. So the women who are into women were originally part of a female sphere, woman on, on both sides. They've got no masculinity in them at all. So that one's out. We also have the descriptions of Lady Love and Sappho. And I mean, I could sit here all day long and recite the gayest poetry the ancient Mediterranean has to offer, but then we'd, we'd really get off the rails here. The point is, there's nothing really that would suggest any sort of stereotype for women who are into women, one way or another. It just seems like sapphic longing. And I mean, I guess that's why they call it sapphic longing, huh? What else? Well, we've got the poet Alcman as well. Alcman lived during the 7th century BCE, so roughly contemporary with Sappho, though it's almost certain that the two of them never met each other because Sappho lived on Lesbos and Alcman was from Sparta. Now, when we think of Sparta, we think of that highly militaristic, martial, fascist state where if you were a boy, you'd grow up to be a soldier, a hoplite. And if you were a girl, you'd grow up to marry a soldier who spent all of his time in the barracks fucking other men while you stayed home, raised the kids, and worked out with other women. After all, two strong parents will have strong children, right? So Sparta didn't exactly prioritize intellectual pursuits the same way that the Athenians did, though it does seem Spartan boys were taught how to read and write. They weren't exactly cranking out the literary hits, though. As a result, most of what we know about Sparta comes from writings from their contemporaries, mostly Athenians. Alcman is one of the rare exceptions. He was actually a Spartan writer, although he might not have been born there. But for the purposes of finding some sort of stereotype of masculine gay women, Again, there's not much to go on. What's next? Well, we've got the poet Martial, who was actually a Roman, not a Greek. Not the same culture, but we can still draw some inferences from it. He lived in the Roman province of Hispania, modern day Spain, and wrote during the first and second centuries CE. He was known for his satirical epigrams. And in particular, he had a couple of epigrams that mention a masculine gay woman, or so I'm told. Every copy of this book that I've been able to find just didn't bother translating those sections. Now, a million years ago, I made my first video on this channel here where we talked about one of the reasons why a lot of transgender history doesn't survive until the 21st century. And one of those reasons is because of deliberate erasure from the historical record. And this is the sort of thing that I'm talking about. The whole of Martial's works are translated into English, except for the naughty bits, the bits that deal with queer stuff. Imagine you're reading through Martial's works in translation because you think the Romans are kind of cool, and all of a sudden you come upon Ipsarum tribarum tribas filaini recte quam futuis vocas amicam. What am I supposed to do with that? I mean, 
I can do something about that because I do know a little bit of Latin, though I'm very, very rusty. But it turns out I'm going to have to do something about it because I've looked all over the internet and I've not been able to find a translation of this. So I guess I got to do this myself. There are two of them, both in book seven, epigram 67 and epigram 70. Now it's been a long time since I've done any direct Latin translation. This, this is what I'm going off of. If you've studied Latin, you recognize Wheelock's Latin. Uh, just, I'm almost certainly going to screw this up, but I'm going to do my best here. Okay. One hour later. So epigram 70 reads something like this. Duckiest of the very ducks, Philinus. It is correct for you to call the girl you fuck your girlfriend. <laughs> okay, neato. The word tribas comes from Greek. It means to rub, and it's where we get the phrase tribadism, which is a more polite way to describe scissoring in the same way that fellatio is a more polite way to say sucking cock and... Uh, okay, awesome. So I translated epigram 70 because it was only a sentence long that's much more palatable. I hadn't even looked at epigram 67 yet, so I started digging into it, but oh my god, I mean, listen to this thing. Pedicas pueros tribas filainis et tentigine saivior mariti undinas dolat in die puelas harpasto quoque sibilgata ludit et flywescit hafe grawesque draukis halteras facili rotat lacerto et putri lutu lutulenta de palestra a uh, yada 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 anyway it goes on it took me about an hour to translate the first sentence which goes philinus the dick fucks boys in the ass and more ferociously than any husband, rails 11 girls a day. I'd love to translate the whole thing, but it is way too long. But fortunately, I actually was able to track down a translation of this one in particular, not number 70, only 67. But I'm not going to throw away that first line that I did, because again, it took me way too damn long. And looking at the translation, it's close enough that it's kosher. So here it is, but with my first line preserved. Today, on great works of ancient literature, Philinus the Dick fucks boys in the ass, and more ferociously than any husband, rails eleven girls a day. With her clothes hoisted up, she also plays ball, and rubbing her body down with sand from a confident arm swings weights that studs would find heavy. Now filthy from the dusty palaestra, she takes the beatings of a well-oiled gymnastics master. She doesn't recline or eat until she's vomited three liters of wine, and thinks she can carry on this way after wolfing down sixteen meatballs. Then when she's horny, she doesn't suck cocks. Not manly enough, she thinks, but greedily devours young girls' groins. May the gods bring you to your senses, Philinus, you who believe it manly to lick snatch. Now, both of these are about a woman named Philinus who clearly gets it. Unfortunately, this opens up yet another path to go down. I really try to avoid tangents, believe it or not, but sometimes it's just unavoidable. This script is 34 pages long. It is the longest script I've ever written. I cut down some stuff, believe it or not. I'm doing my best here. But there's so much background knowledge that I got to get into it because most of y'all don't have a background in classical studies. I'm writing this for my fellow trans people, not my fellow classicists. And most of y'all are probably not both. Anyway, Philinus. If Philinus was a real person, her father was named Achimenes, and she was from Samos, an island south of Lesbos. It was famed for its prostitution. She also apparently wrote a famous manual on sex that described a whole bunch of different sexual positions. But 
it doesn't survive today. She's mentioned in several other ancient sources as well, including some early Christian sources. Remember Justin Martyr? We talked about him in the video on the Christians. Yeah, he wasn't really a big fan of Philinus. Big shocker there. Whatever, Justin, go cut off your junk and stop bothering people. Most scholars today agree that she wasn't a real person, probably, but rather a persona. If you were a writer in the ancient world and you wanted to put some smut out there, you might publish it under the name Philinus. But whether or not Philinus was a real person, whether or not Philinus was a pen name, the character in Martial's epigrams is definitely not a real person. This is a fictional character. That's because Martial was a satirist as well, just like Lucian. Even within Martial's work, Philinus is not a single character. Each of these epigrams is self-contained, so she shows up a bunch of other times as well, not just in these two. In fact, in one of them she's dead, and then in the following one she comes back and it's just fine. But whatever way you want to slice it, she's clearly very, very manly. But first of all, Martial was a Roman, not a Greek. Again, not the same thing. As well, Martial's portrayal of Philinus is very different than Lucian's portrayal of Megillus. Philinus f***s non-stop. 11 girls a day. And Megillus might hire prostitutes sometimes, but he's married. Philinus is into guys and girls, and Megillus is only shown with women. Philinus is ravenous and insatiable, and Megillus seems more measured in his sexuality. Philinus is always masculine, but Megillus is only so in bed. So Philinus might be the closest parallel, but they're still worlds apart from each other. And it also doesn't negate Plato and Sappho and Alcman. What it tells us is that there's essentially no stereotype of women who are into women in the ancient world one way or another. That might have been deliberate, though. Author K.J. Dover wonders if we have so few sources about women who love women in the ancient world because it made men feel uncomfortable. After all, most of our surviving writers are men, and they wrote for men. There were some taboo subjects that satirists just didn't touch. The Plague of Athens from 430 BCE is a great example of this. No satirists touched it, and after living through this decade so far, I think we can understand why that might be the case. So it's possible that female homosexuality had a similar sort of taboo. It's hard to say, but the reality is, other than these few literary sources and a couple of pieces of pottery that show women doing their thing with each other, there's not much in the way of material that would allow us to put together some sort of consistent stereotype about gay women in the ancient world, one way or another. So I think we can probably toss this one out. I don't think Megillus was a caricature of a lesbian. Is he a caricature of a lesbian? That is the island lesbian, not the sexuality lesbian. This one is actually more likely. The Greeks did have certain stereotypes that they associated with each other. The Spartans, for example, were considered to be not the sharpest spear in the armory. Various translators of plays with Spartan characters in them have tried to reproduce this by playing on modern prejudices, which is... Uh, pick up a copy of Aristophanes' Lysistrata, for example, and try to figure out what sort of accent the translator is going to give Lampito, the Spartan woman character. She's provincial and less refined. What's that going to sound like? Anyway, the Spartans weren't stupid, but they didn't value things like poetry and philosophy and rhetoric the way the Athenians did. They were a society of soldiers. But if Plutarch is to be believed, some of the things they said over the years are pretty funny. Plutarch, like Lucian, was a Greek who lived during Roman rule. He was born in the year 45 CE, during the reign of the emperor Claudius. He was made consul by Trajan, the highest rank in Roman society other than emperor, and died in 120 CE during the reign of the emperor Hadrian. One of his works is a collection of essays, Moralia, and in them he records some of the particularly clever things Spartans have said over the years. For example, we've all seen the movie 300, I'm sure. It's very dumb in very many ways, but one of the most wonderful lines in it actually comes from Plutarch, which is kind of cool. When someone said, because of the arrows of the barbarians, it will be impossible to see the sun, the Spartan king Leonidas responds with, won't it be nice then if we shall have some shade 
in which to fight them. Everyone loves this one. The Spartan king Xerxes was famously merciful toward people who would surrender to him. So he sent an envoy to the Spartans, asking them to lay down their arms. Their response, Molon Lave, come and take them. King Agis III of Sparta was being pestered by somebody who kept asking him annoying questions. When he finally asked who the greatest Spartan was, the king responded, the one who is the least like you. And this one is my personal favorite. When Philip of Macedon, Alexander's father, was conquering Greece, he sent an envoy to the Spartans, asking them to join him. After all, his plan was to unite Greece. He wanted everybody to submit to his rule, and then he was going to fight Persia. But the Spartans would have none of it, which was incredibly frustrating to Philip. After some back and forth, he sent an envoy saying, if I invade Laconia, which is Sparta, I shall turn you out. And the Spartans response? If. God, I love it. What do these have in common? They are short, they are punchy, they're to the point. That's where we get the phrase laconic wit from, from Laconia or Lacedaemonia, which is Sparta and the area around it. It's different from the elaborate Athenian wit, of course, but not exactly what you'd expect from a bunch of boneheads banging rocks together. Anyway, the point is the way the Greeks stereotyped each other is not that much different than how we stereotype each other today. Perhaps there's a kernel of truth, but it's filtered through so many different cultural lenses, so many misunderstandings, so many condescensions, that it becomes completely twisted to the point of absurdity. So we don't know where Leina and Clinarion were from. They lived in Athens, but they might have been from somewhere else. There's not much to work with there. But we know Megillus is from Lesbos, and Demonassa is from Corinth. That's something we can work with. Let's start with Corinth. Athens and Sparta get most of the historical attention, but Corinth was no slouch either. It's right on the Isthmus of Corinth, which is the land bridge connecting the Peloponnese, which is where Sparta and Argos and some other places were, with Attica, which is where Athens is, and then from there to the north and the rest of Greece. This made it an easily defensible point. After the Battle of Thermopylae, where the This is Sparta guy where he died, the Persians pushed further. Euboea, Phocis, Boeotia, and even Attica itself fell to the Persians. But the allied Greeks fortified Corinth. That stopped the Persians from advancing any further. From there, they pushed back, pushing the Persians out of Greece, back to Asia. The Isthmus also made Corinth a very wealthy city. They controlled all the land traffic between Athens, itself a very wealthy city, and the Peloponnese. So if you were a traveler traveling by land in Greece, at some point you would find yourself passing through Corinth. But they would also have ships drop off goods at the northwestern coast and then carry them across by land to the southeastern coast, where they would ship them further. This meant sailors could avoid the treacherous journey around the Peloponnese, so it was well worth the price of admission. There's a canal there now today, of course, but in the ancient world, this was the closest you could get. They even had their own distinct type of columns. Have you ever seen Greek columns before? Have you ever noticed that they're not all actually the same? There are actually three different types of them. First, Doric columns. These were used in Sparta, and they're so Spartan, aren't they? Functional, simple, nothing unnecessary, laconic architecture to go with their laconic wit. Next, Ionian columns. These were common in Athens, the Greek cities along the coast of Asia Minor, and most of the Greek islands. Elegant, balanced, not too elaborate, suitable for a city of navel-gazing philosopher nerds. But some people really do go out of their way to show off their wealth, don't they? Rolling up to the club in a matte-painted Ferrari, purple lights glowing beneath it, a gorgeous model on each arm, several gold rings on each finger, each one of those adorned with some sort of precious jewel, logos everywhere you can see them, getting bottle service with a thousand dollar bottle of vodka. If DJ Khaled were a Greek column, he'd be a Corinthian one. So Corinthians had a reputation for money, but they also had a reputation for their sexual proclivities. Corinth was the home of the Temple of Aphrodite, where a different type of prostitution than what we looked at before went on. 
This was sacred prostitution. The Roman geographer Strabo gives us some interesting insight into how this might have worked in Corinth. He says, quote, And the temple of Aphrodite was so rich that it owned more than a thousand temple slaves, courtesans whom both men and women had dedicated to the goddess. And therefore it was also on account of these women that the city was crowded with people and grew rich. For instance, the ship captains freely squandered their money, and hence the proverb, not for every man is the voyage to Corinth. So not only was Corinth wealthy, but the temple prostitutes helped keep the wealth generated in Corinth in the city. After all, they were pretty good at getting visitors, sea captains in particular, to spend their money there. Now you may find arguments that this sort of thing never actually existed. Scholar Stephanie Budin, for example, argues that what we actually know about this is based on misunderstandings, sometimes deliberate, sometimes not, of what actually went on in these temples. They were either non-sexual religious practices or ritual sex that wasn't paid for. She believes it might actually be a result of cultural slander which is not unheard of as well. That's worth exploring, but not here, because we're talking about how the Greeks stereotyped themselves. And from a stereotypical perspective, Corinth was clearly known for money and sex. That's Demonos' entire role here, isn't it? She's got money and she has sex. That's it, that's all she does. So this explanation works for her, no problem. What about Megillus? We talked about how capital L lesbians had a stereotype for being lowercase lesbians, but is there anything else about Megillus's description that suggests a stereotype of being from Lesbos? People from Lesbos did have a reputation for being sexually adventurous. I know I keep saying that, like apparently that's true of all the Greeks, but no, this is true of Lesbos in particular. Clearly that's the case with Megillus and Demonassa. They have sex with prostitutes, after all. But K.J. Dover suggests that based on the writings of Sappho, as well as Alcman, people from Lesbos were thought to have the ability to make people orgasm just by touching them. Seems like a useful skill, but that's not how Megillus is portrayed here. After all, Leina doesn't seem terribly satisfied by her experience with Megillus, does she? Of course, sometimes writers can start with a stereotype in order to subvert it, which is very common in sketch comedy, which is the like closest parallel we have to this here. But of course, the sketch is pretty compressed. They're very short, so you don't have a whole lot of time to establish a character before you flip expectations on its head. So you have to rely on stock characters. Key and Peele are excellent at this. Take this sketch, for example. Originally, I was going to show a short clip of this sketch that seemed like it was fair use, but then I got a copyright strike. So instead, I'll leave this here as a tribute. Go to hell, Paramount. The camera angle, the lighting, the acting, the dramatic music, it's all evocative of a scene you've seen before in a heist movie, even if you can't think of exactly where. And because it's familiar, your mind automatically fills in a bunch of the details. We don't need to know the backstory of these characters for it to be effective. We don't even need to know their names. We're still told enough for our minds to fill in the blanks. So when Key's character describes his big heist plan, you start to realize, along with Peel's character, he's just describing getting a job at the bank. Motherfucker, that's called a job! As a result, your expectations are subverted. This doesn't look like the sort of guy who would suggest getting a job at the bank, but here we are. They subvert what we expect from that scene, and that's what makes it funny. But that only works because we're given enough information to flip it around, which is done through the medium of visual storytelling. Are we given the same with Megillus? Not really. But it's also hard to figure out what a stereotypical stock character of somebody from Lesbos might have been in the first place. They were known for poetry. Two of the nine lyric poets, Sappho and Alcaeus, were from Lesbos. This was a group of nine poets that scholars in Alexandria thought were pretty great. Alcman is on the list too, by the way, but Megillus isn't a poet. They were, and still are, known for wine. But although they were at a drinking party, nobody mentions the word wine at any point in this entire dialogue. Of course, wine was the drink of choice for Greeks, so it's natural to assume they were drinking wine, but you'd think they would make more of a thing out of the fact that they were drinking wine. If they wanted to lean on this, we could say 
the fact that he's from Lesbos, but doesn't really display any characteristics of somebody from Lesbos is the joke. And that can work, but that doesn't explain why Lucian made him a man. He could have easily accomplished that without making him a man. So even if he is a subversion of a character from Lesbos, I don't think that's telling the whole story here. Is he a caricature of a man? Okay, you're lesbians, but like, which one of you is the man? McGillis, clearly. <laughs> He says so himself, but men were expected to be the dominant partner in both Greek and in Roman society. And he's clearly the dominant partner here, but is that a caricature? He does display things that are traditionally related to masculinity. He shaves his head, he calls himself a guy, that's pretty stereotypically masculine, right? And he's into girls. <laughs> Not that the last part is necessarily masculine, mind you. But those sort of aspects don't really paint any sort of caricature. Not really. There's nothing in particular there to satirize. Like, where's the joke? In fact, Philinus seems much more of a caricature of masculinity than Megillus is at all. There's just not a whole lot to say about this one otherwise. Ugh, I'm tired. I'm over this. I'm over this. There's the rest of the day. Chapter 6. So, what is he? Unlike a lot of other ancient literature that deals with the Hetairai, Lucian gets into their personal lives a lot more. Dialogues of the Courtesans shows kind of the nastier side of what life as a Hetaira would have been like. In Dialogue 6, the courtesan is an unwilling participant, forced into the trade after the death of her father, and her family runs out of money. In Dialogues 2 and 12, the courtesans argue over a perceived infidelity. In Dialogue 7, a courtesan keeps one of her clients around, despite him being kind of a deadbeat and not paying anything. And of course, in Dialogue 5, Leina is clearly an unwilling participant in the arrangement with Megillus and Demonassa. But again, if this was Lucian's purpose, if this was his goal with this piece, he could have done that without making Megillus a man. It would have been just as effective if Megillus was Megilla, the lesbian woman from Lesbos. It's also possible that Lucian, being a man, living in a very patriarchal society, would have had no idea how women had sex with each other. And so he may have just imagined, well, one of them has to be a man, right? Because how do you have sex with there's no men involved? That just doesn't make any sense, does it? So Lucian made Megillus a man in bed and a woman everywhere else. Perhaps the goal was just to make Leina uncomfortable with the whole arrangement. But even that doesn't work because as we talked about in the ancient world, sex was something you did taking the masculine role or was done to you taking the feminine role. And Megillus doesn't act like a top the entire time. There are certain words used in the ancient Greek that suggest that he was taking a passive role in his relationship with Demonassa as well. Another argument is that it's a reference to philosophical dialogues, notably Plato's Symposium. Usually, philosophical dialogues center people in power. For example, the Symposium takes place at the party of an upper-class man's house in Athens. Athenaeus's Depnosophistai has a similar setting. Xenophon's Hiero is a dialogue between the tyrant of Syracuse and a lyric poet who is convinced that the life of a king and the life of a pauper, one is not really better than the other. But dialogues of the courtesans, well, it's in the name, isn't it? At one point, Clonarion refers to Megillus as a hetairistria, which as we mentioned in the video on Christianity, is a term that was used to refer to women who were into women. But this term shows up nowhere else in ancient Greece before Dialogues of the Courtesans, except for in Plato's Symposium, where he's using it to refer to those ball people that we talked about, the ones that come from a woman-woman sphere pairing. And in another of Plato's works, there is actually a character named Megillus, though he's a little different than the one we see in Dialogues of the Courtesans. In that text, he's a Spartan warrior, and he doesn't really show any signs of gender nonconformity. Homosexuality in that text is portrayed as something kind of base, not base de, but base, something kind of kind of looked down upon, something that like the weird Spartans did and not something that good upper class Athenian men did, which if you know anything about Greek homosexuality, then 
not terribly historically accurate, but our Megillus, the one in dialogues, his shaved head and strong physical physique might have evoked a Spartan warrior. So this ties him into a bit of a broader literary tradition, even if there were not really any direct analogues before him. But this is a bit of a reach too. Did Lucian really need to make a gender fluid slash trans masculine character just to create a reference to Plato? Not really. As you can see, it's difficult to come to any sort of satisfying conclusion on this one way or another. There's a good reason why more ink has been spilled on Dialogue 5 than on any other of these dialogues. There's just, it's just so complex and it's difficult to figure out what Lucian actually meant when he made Megillus the way he is. Chapter 7. So what can Megillus tell us about transgender history? It's tempting to imagine that Lucian wrote this text after having a conversation with a Hetaira who described some sort of similar situation to him, and that Megillus's, even if it's a bit of a third-hand account, a description of what we might consider today to be transmasculine or at least gender fluid. It's tempting, to be sure. But while we don't have any direct evidence disproving this, we also don't have any evidence proving it either. So what does that leave us? Well, we can kind of use euhemerism. We talked about euhemerism in the video on Hermaphroditus, but in case this is your first time to the channel, here's a quick refresher. It's basically a lens through which to view mythological stories that assumes that at some point something resembling that story happened and it's just been exaggerated and told and retold and embellished and changed over a centuries long game of broken telephone. In the case of Hermaphroditus, we took the approach that assumed their myths suggested the existence of intersex people in the ancient world as well. And from there, we looked at the evidence that could support that theory. Can we use the same approach with Megillus? Sort of. Euhemerism is a lens through which we view mythology, and Dialogues of the Courtesans is decidedly not mythology. Yes, it does reference mythology. It talks about Achilles, about Hermaphroditus, about Tiresias, but that doesn't make it mythology. It is a work of fiction. Euhemerism relies on that centuries-long game of broken telephone to give us the stories that we get. The Trojan War, for example. We know that that was a thing that happened. We know there was a city called Troy. We know at some point it was destroyed. We know there were some Greeks there, but that's all we know. The information that we read in the Iliad is embellished. It's been told, retold, exaggerated, misunderstood over centuries of oral poets re-describing the story to others. And when you've got a text that's that long, you're bound to get some of the details wrong, even if you don't mean to. With Dialogues of the Courtesans, we don't have any of that. Mythology arises in eras where literacy tends to be at a minimum, and so stories are expressed through oral tradition instead. But Lucian was not an oral poet. He was a writer. That said, it's easy to imagine Lucian speaking to some courtesans when he was putting together his idea for this book. When I wrote my first novel, it's called The Bottom Line. The plot focuses on a crew of high-rise construction workers whose jobs are slowly being replaced by robots in the 2050s. And believe it or not, in a past life I actually did do home renovations work, but that's a little different than high-rise construction. So I wanted to make sure I had several conversations with high-rise construction workers because I wanted my characters to be believable. That makes for a better story, right? By the way, the bottom line is being published hopefully this year in 2024 if you happen to be watching this from the future. In which case, I wonder if I finished my second novel through Vreda Literary. Link in the description if you'd like to pre-order a copy or order a copy if you happen to be watching this from the future. In which case, I wonder if I'm dead. I'm really excited about it coming out. Anyway, I can imagine Lucian might have done something similar. Is that based on evidence? No, not necessarily. But as we've already covered extensively, exhaustively over, God, what, how long is this video at this point? It's difficult to come to a satisfying conclusion about what Lucian was trying to get at here. What you get from these videos is essentially my own research process. 
I don't necessarily know what conclusion I'm going to come to when I start researching this stuff. I do have a long, long list of topics that I'm trying to get to. And yeah, I wish I could get to them faster, but, but this isn't exactly my full-time job. If you want them faster, Patreon in the description. Anyway, I don't usually start with a conclusion when it comes to writing this stuff. I just start with an idea and I see where it takes me. So I started this video because Dialogue 5 looks pretty gosh darn transy, doesn't it? And it's easy to just report what I'm reading uncritically at face value, but unless we dig a little deeper, we're not actually doing any sort of critical analysis. We're not actually doing any sort of history. That's the like right wing approach to, to research, right? To have a conclusion and then to look for evidence that supports that conclusion. No, we don't want to do it that way. We want to look at the evidence and allow it to lead us to whatever conclusion we come to. That's what we did about the Elagabalus video. I knew about the transy bits of Elagabalus' story, but what I didn't know was the details. And though I'd love to have dug into it and come back and said, hey, look, it's a transgender Roman emperor. The evidence did not support that. It would have been irresponsible of me to say that Elagabalus is transgender when the evidence is not there. And honestly, that's probably for the best because if we uncritically accept what the sources say about Elagabalus, yes, she was trans, but she was also a terrible, terrible, terrible person. So we don't really need that sort of company, do we? So what conclusion can we take from this is this transgender history strictly speaking no lucian may conceivably have based the character megillus on somebody who actually did exist or on a report that he heard about somebody who did exist but if that's true there is no evidence to either confirm or deny that no this is literature but literature does not exist in a vacuum it is a reflection of the society in which it was created. Whether it's satirizing current events like in old comedy or lampooning just kind of day-to-day -day interactions, which is what we see more in line with new comedy, it reflects the society in which it was created because the Greeks too lived in a society. So what can we as modern transgender people take away from Dialogue 5? To start, it's self-evident that the Greeks had a broader understanding of gender than the simple biology is destiny binary. Lucian provides very clearly four different examples of that. Megillus himself, of course, but then also Achilles, Hermaphroditus, and Tiresias. Whether it's through circumstance, genetics, divine intervention or just wanting to get your freak on, the idea is clearly there that gender is more complicated. It's also clear that existing outside of the gender binary is not necessarily viewed as a bad thing. Achilles and Tiresias, for example, are highly regarded figures. They both lived as women for a certain part of their lives, for different reasons, of course, but that doesn't make them objects of scorn or ridicule. And Hermaphroditus had temples built to them. They were quite literally worshipped. Dionysus as well is also considered like a gender fluid sort of figure, almost like an ancient equivalent to a femboy. And Leina ends Dialogue 5 by invoking Aphrodite Urania in saying she doesn't want to talk about what what they all did together. And Aphrodite Urania is a specific aspect of the goddess related to her birth on Cyprus from the castrated nads of Uranos. And there is a very long history of the worship of a transgender Aphrodite on Cyprus. I've been working on that one too. That video is the script is like almost twice as long as this one and I am nowhere near finished because there is so much research to get into. So while Megillus may or may not have been a real guy in ancient Greece, gender fluidity was clearly still a thing that existed in the minds of the ancient Greeks. In some cases, yes, it was shunned, but not as a rule, not necessarily. That's of course not to imply that ancient Greece was a paradise for gender non-conforming people. That would also be irresponsible to say. That is not the case. But it is also not necessarily the hellscape that phobes try to make it out to be. Because the human story has always included transgender people. And so long as the human story endures, so too will we.